Can, I think they can see you down there, Holly, and hopefully I'm not cutting off my head. Welcome to HortTube. My name is John Putnam. This is a video going over my biggest perennial flowering plant uh, winners for uh, 2022. It's toward the end of August, and so I'm just going to sit here and talk through them and show you the uh, video of the of the of the plants in peak flower, because you know most of our summer, spring, summer, or fall flowering perennials aren't don't flower over that entire span, and so a lot of them have passed peak at this point, and I'll just show you what they look like in peak flower. The things that last into late summer, um, where we are now, are things like hibiscus and agastache and, and uh, salvias, you know, tend to really hold up through the uh, summer heat. I've got some agapanthus that's holding up through the summer heat, that kind of thing. So I'm going to sit down in the middle of my annuals. <laughs> flowers that were in another video a week or so ago if you want to go through my uh my big winners for annuals that video is already up um, but we'll just talk through here what were my big perennial winners add a comment down below with what your uh, big perennial winners were for this year i have a ton of other perennials out here i'm not going to be talking about hosta in this video but there are a ton of them in this landscape and many many other perennials here a lot of things that were planted this year that aren't going to be big show-offs in the first season uh, in the ground that might be my big winners uh, for next year but let's get started on what was the big winners uh, for this year i'm definitely going to jump right to salvias uh, my rhythm and blues salvia in the back garden here tends to be the hummingbird's favorite plant uh, that one is marginally hardy here, and I've got it in a spot where it's coming back, and it'll come back reliably every year once it comes back. And it is just, it's got to be controlled each year when it comes up. Um, it will have a bigger footprint uh, each year uh, that it comes up, but I do, I do, like, I do like the plant a lot. Uh, I've got another one called Amistad that's similar to it out by the front fence. Same thing, when that one comes back each year, uh, it'll have to be uh, uh, controlled slightly. Uh, I've got one called Mulberry Jam that I really love. Uh, I've had it for, um, I've had this one two or three uh, seasons now. It's just a fantastic plant uh, and it competes well with a lot of other annuals that I have crowded, crowded around it. The late flowering uh, salvias, uh, the salvia leucantha, uh, got one called emerald and green. They typically don't bloom until fall, but the foliage looks fantastic throughout the season, but it's nice to have something uh, going right into fall, and then I've got a purple uh, pineapple sage as well, or salvia elegans. And then the early flowering uh, salvia that are out here in the landscape, salvia nemorosa, uh, that uh, they, they bloomed early in the season and kind of done by, mid, you know, by midsummer. All of them are great for the bees, all of them are great for the uh, hummingbirds. So my little Joe, Joe Pieweed, uh, definitely a big winner. It's almost six feet tall, and if you look at any tag on it, it definitely is not supposed to get quite that big and you'll see that with a lot of perennial flowering things is that maybe in my garden here a little further south than maybe where you're watching things are going to get larger uh, during a uh, during a single season uh, before they before they start flowering so they may come up out of the ground you know as much as a month earlier and that puts a lot more height on them I've got the regular uh, native joe pie weed out in the front garden and it's 12 feet tall so the but the little joe back here is just you know it's just a it's a great great uh, plant and it is compact, uh, you know, a lot of growth in a small space, but it is six feet in height at this point. The bee bomb out by the front gate, uh, the BU Bee Free Bee Bomb, is just such a great plant. So clean. It's got a little bit of powdery mildew on it here late season after it has finished flowering. Again, it's another one of those plants that for me here in the south got over three feet in height, and I think it would surprise others, you know, further north how, how much taller that it can get here. I'm probably this winter going to dig it up and move it a little bit from its current location. It's a little tall for where, where it's sitting out there in the front garden, but it'll, it'll transplant readily, uh, no problem at all. Great, great plant. There are several Agastache out here in the garden, and they are the bees' number one go-to plant here uh, at the end of the season. I've got a gold foliage one called Golden Jubilee. A great plant, uh, one called Little Adder, which is you know blooming like crazy and is very compact. And then I've got Blue Fortune, Agast uh, Agastache, which is probably the most vigorous, uh, vigorous of all. And uh, it's a cross between a native and a, uh, an Asian uh, Agastache, but it is it is the bees' number one favorite plant in the landscape here in the last four or five weeks uh, since it really started blooming profusely, and it'll go right through the fall. 
just an amazing plant. Uh, butterfly weed, there are several uh, Asclepias uh, in this landscape. Uh, the Asclepias tuberosa is super, super colorful. Great plant, uh, host plant, um, you know, for, for uh, monarch butterflies. Although I have not had any, any caterpillars uh, this year on it, but it bloomed beautifully, sets these super interesting seed pods, and then the, um, the seeds are actually interesting as well. Just a great plant, super, super reliable. I've also got Asclepia syriaca and uh, swamp uh, milkweed as well, or the uh, Asclepias incarnata as well. It tends to bloom a little bit later in the season, but all three of those are represented in the garden as well as other host plants as well uh, for caterpillars. And so uh, there's, there's, some, there's some fennel and some other things out here that are specifically here uh, for caterpillars to devour, and I hope they do. I enjoy that part of gardening. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people be freaked out by their plants being eaten by them, but it, uh, it's, it's actually kind of interesting, kind of interesting to watch. And so, um, don't just ha uh, you know, my recommendation is don't just have the plants that draw in the pollinators, but also have the host plants uh, for for the caterpillars as well. Uh, for Fujium, this is one of my absolute uh, favorite favorite plants. I've got the gig. Um, uh, the uh, uh, gigantic one back here, a lot of people call tractor seat plant, uh, gets quite big. These don't flower until the fall, and it's one of my really one of my favorite plants to recommend in in shade gardens uh, here in the south because it uh, it's a great pollinator plant into the fall, and so you have this beautiful foliage all season long, and then uh, then the flowers are in the fall. There's also interesting. Uh, foliage in these as well and so I, I'm about to plant one called firefly that has a uh, spotting on the leaf really beautiful there are lots and lots of varieties of these and then one also called crispa that has a uh, almost a uh, a lettuce like leaf on it a uh, really really beautiful plant the deer don't eat these uh, which is definitely a draw for them if you have a shade garden and you're in, you're in the south here uh, great plants to um, to plant have fall pollinators and you know not have the deer eat them as well. I uh, have several anemones in the uh, landscape. Uh, the one uh, out by the road is called Fall in Love Sweetly. That thing is just fantastic. It started blooming about two weeks ago and it looks like it, it's got so it's got so many buds on it I think it'll bloom right through the uh, the fall. Highly recommend uh, fall blooming anemones for your landscape. Again it's so easy, you know, I'm sitting in all these annual flowers right now and it's so easy to have things flowering in, in he, here, here in my area as early as April and then of course almost everywhere, May, June, July, and then you get to this gap here in you know, August, September, uh, October where it's mu much harder. So you really have to select plants for those, uh, for those spots and the fall blooming anemones definitely fill in uh, that spot. Lots of cone flowers. Uh, this season. Uh, the powwow wildberry continues to be uh, just a fantastic plant. All the powwow ones that I've planted, the powwow white, uh, man that thing is super 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 showy. Uh, I've got a, a yellow one out there as well and then several uh, sombrero series uh, cone flowers as well and the sombreros have been just fantastic performers. A lot of these I don't want to say a lot of them, but there are some new cone flowers that I just find to have been a little bit wimpy. But the powwow series and the sombrero series are pretty tough plants that seem to come back reliably, and pollinators, you know, absolutely love them. And they've been, you know, just vivid, vivid colors for us as humans. But they also seem to uh, draw in just as many bees as the uh, non-hybridized cone flowers do. I also have some rudbeckia out here, and several rudbeckia that I actually do from seed. Uh, every year and I fill in a few extras every year. They're not always the most uh, reliable thing coming back for me and sometimes don't come back where I want them. <laughs> you know, they'll come back somewhere else. And so I tend to plug a few seeded Rudbeckia or Black Eyed Susans. They are perennial, but I do add a few seeded ones around my uh, uh, red bud over here uh, every year. And uh, I always have that gold pop of color in front of that gold red bud, which seems like it'd be overkill. They actually work fantastic together and then native hibiscus uh the uh you know the dinner plate hibiscus there's one out by the uh, front gate that's a little bit of a wetter spot the water in the front garden tends to pull toward that area of the fence and those hibiscus are really really happy when they have uh, 
when they have water, you know, and so that thing's just grown and bloomed like crazy all season long, no stress on it. I'm lucky that I don't have Japanese beetles because uh, Japanese beetles do love them as well. So if you have Japanese beetle problems, they may not be the, uh, the absolute best plant, but that's some of my uh, winners for this season. If you go back earlier in the season, there were, oh my gosh, maybe as many as a hundred new perennials went in here this season uh, between hosta varieties and veronica and lots of other things I haven't talked about uh, going through this list of my big winners for this season. So I expect a lot of that stuff to be big performers next year. I didn't talk about hellebores, which bloom in the winter and uh, you know lots or late winter, early spring. Uh, so there's lots of lots of other perennials out here that are also great. But again, a lot of them are small, and so I think next year's list will be different than this year's list, having some things be in the ground in their second year. But again, add, down, add a comment down below with what your favorite perennials were for 2022. Uh, and uh, I'm also going to have a seed video in the next week or two showing a lot of my annual and perennial seeds that I'm going to be starting for next season. Thanks for watching.